Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again this week. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule every day to watch us at the same time. Uh, You may be watching this via YouTube, so you would be able to watch it, of course, on your time. We finished uh, filming Romans 8 uh, last week, and uh, we kind of rushed through, I think, the latter part of Romans 8. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I need to kind of come back and pick up a few things that I kind of rushed over in this eighth chapter of Romans. One of the things that I absolutely love about doing television is that I've got the time to break down stuff that I normally cannot do when I am on the road preaching in two and three day settings. So I want to, uh, because there's so many people, I had a really encouraging uh, uh, message this morning from a pastor in South Florida who thanked me so much for the series that uh, we did back some time ago on Romans. So these uh, studies, I think, are vital to so many believers that I don't want to rush through anything. So we're going to go back and pick some things up. And once again, let me just encourage you that if you've missed any of these, you can go back to our YouTube channel and uh, you can watch them on demand. You can also hear the audio portions on our podcast, Spotify. You can also uh, listen to it on your Android device. Easiest way to do that is to go to my website, and in the upper right-hand corner there are icons that will lead you directly to that channel where you can watch them, download them, do whatever you want with them. And so we're thankful that our partners have enabled us to allow us to share uh, these things with you and these teachings that I believe are vital to our faith sometimes. And so we just thank the Lord for the opportunity to be able to share that with you. But once again, we're coming back in this uh, series, and uh, I'm going to begin, first of all, in Romans 8, the 26th verse, because like I said, last time we filmed, we rushed through so quickly that we missed, I think, some vital pieces. Remember, even as I'm teaching this, I need to reiterate this. The book of Romans was written as a letter. It is meant to be read in one sitting. And so if you just pull one chapter out, and I think that's where much of our problems have done in theologies, we, theologically, is that we pulled out one chapter, one verse out of context, and forget that the whole theme of what's being built here is all one letter. And so, you know, it's one of the most incredible treaties of God is inclusiveness in bringing in both Jew and Gentile, that when we see it in the context of who it's written to, who, the what, the when, the where, the why, we start to have a whole lot more understanding. Well, I won't take any more time talking about uh, uh, introducing Romans 8, because we've already done four programs on the Romans 8. I want to go to the 26th verse to begin with, and I'm going to read from New King James Version first. Uh, today. We might read it also from the message, but it says verse number 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So, you know, the first thing that I wanted to think, because, you know, sometimes, like I say, well, we, we, we brush over things so quickly that we miss some emphatic points here. Because Paul was talking about the struggle from Romans 7, when I want to do good, evil is present with me, and who will deliver me from the body of this death? And then he talks about in Romans 8, thank God he will, and then he talks about the redemption from the body. The same body that he was talking about in Romans 7 is the same body that he brings us redemption from, in Romans 8. And I think that's individual, but I think it's also corporate, because we see in Romans 6 he connects the whole theme not back to Israel, but back to Adam. Romans 5 and 6, one man did it wrong, got us in all this trouble, was sin and death, another man did it right, got us out of it. And then Romans 6 talks about we become dead to sin, alive to God. Romans 7 talks about uh, being married to another even whom who was raised from the dead, and it's again the dilemma between Adam and Christ the old man and the new man. 
So He's moving us, not only our individual bodies are being set free from sin, but He's moving us out of the body of sin, which was Adam, and into the body of Christ and the adoption, the placement as sons, both individually and corporately, is the adoption that He's talking about. Uh, And I'm not taking anything away from the individual adoption to with the redemption of our bodies, but I want to show you that He's really talking even about the inclusion of both Jew and Gentile in one body. And as we go through Romans 9, 10, and 11, we're going to see that that one body is the body of Christ, that he that the mystery of the ages is that He would bring together in one uh, both Jew and Gentile, and that the mystery that was hid from ages is Christ in and among all of you, the hope of glory. But as he begins to talk about the struggle again here, he's starting to say, here's something I need you to know. While you used to do this thing on the basis of trying to do it through human strength and struggle, I need you to know this. He said the likewise the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. Now, I don't know about you, but that's really incredibly good news, because in the Old Covenant, it's full of demand without any supply. And in the New Covenant, it's full of supply with very little demand. The Spirit Himself it helps our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Now I want to stop here again and and, and emphasize this a little bit, because what Paul is talking about here is one of the most powerful tools that I believe believers forget about and that is learning how to pray in the Spirit, with groanings that know the Spirit knows what is the mind of the Spirit. I've really begun to practice this in the last couple of years. As one of my friends I heard teaching on praying in tongues and praying in the Spirit, is that the, 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 uh, the Spirit already knows what is the mind of the Spirit. And what I've begun to do, even at times when I've had the Lord even awaken me in the night season, or uh, even when I'm, uh, you know, just ministering to people, is to pray in the Holy Spirit and direct that prayer towards those people. But not only does the, the, the groanings of the Holy Spirit work as praying for other people, but it also, we build ourselves up in our most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost, and letting the Holy Ghost make intercession and prayer that begins to, uh, you know, to me, I don't know why anybody would try to talk you out of this kind of a gift. You know, many people say, well, that, you know, that gift is just for certain individuals. Well, you know, why would God be a respecter person and just give it to certain individuals? I think He really wants to give a prayer language to all of us that we might be able to pray what is the mind of the Spirit in the Spirit of God, and and, uh, let the Spirit Himself make intercession for the saints uh, according to the will of God. And then knowing that, that all things work together for good to them that love God, and those who are called according to His purpose. So as we begin to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to let us know, I'm going to help you with your infirmities. That's good news to me. Uh, the, the Scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews, we have a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, and he's able to sustain and secure us because he's been tempted in all measures like as we are, yet without sin, so that he is able to help us in the time of trouble, that we can receive mercy and a grace to help in the time of trouble. Uh, then he goes on to say, those who are called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He called, He predestined those He, he call, also called. He, those, <coughs> excuse me, these He also called, he, he called, these He also justified. Whom He justified, these He also glorified. You know, one of the things I want you to see here also is that predestination really in many of these scriptures is not talking about who gets to go to heaven 
and who gets who goes to hell. Predestination is not a heaven hell type of scripture. Predestination is determined. What he's saying here is that I didn't just predetermine you to go to heaven. I predestined you to be conformed to the image of the Son. And uh, when you see, uh, you know, uh, other places in the Scripture where it's talking about foreknowledge and predestination, His foreknowledge and predestination was not who would go to heaven and who would go to hell. His predestination was that He had determined the inclusion of the Gentiles even beforehand, because my question in this Scripture would be, whom He did foreknow, who did He not know beforehand? In other words, what He tells us in the book of Colossians is the mystery that was hidden from ages is that God had determined to include the Gentiles. And as we get into Romans 9, we will see this as uh, he's trying to show them that the purpose even of Israel as a nation in Old Testament Israel was in order to be a nation of priests through which God would bless the nations of the earth and bring them into the covenant a promise through a nation of priests. And we'll see, I'll I'll talk more about that when we get into the ninth chapter of Romans. But the predestination is that of being uh, conformed to the image of the Son. In other words, we are called not just to go to heaven. We are called to bear His image in the earth. You know, if you've ever studied any kind of temple theology, Uh, Every god of the past, and even our god, every time a temple was built, they would put the image of that god somehow in that temple. And the first uh, temple, a matter of fact, every tabernacle and every temple throughout the Scriptures was actually a uh, microcosm of uh, of the, the revelation of what was going on in the heavens. Because when God called Moses up the mountain, He said, if you'll reproduce in the earth what I just sowed you in the heavens, I'll come and live with you. So God's ultimate intention is that the whole earth would become His temple, His tabernacle, so that all the earth would be filled with the image of God, or if I could say it like this, all the earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And you can go back and see even as uh, God's first temple was the entire earth, because in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God creates the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, void, darkness is upon the face of the great deep. And the Spirit of God moved over the chaos, and God said, let there be light. There was light, and every step of creation was a picture of God's redemptive work and plan. Because when you get to the end of the sixth day, God's ultimate thing was to put His image in His tabernacle, in His, if you will, His earthly uh, expression of heaven, when God would take what was in the invisible realm called heaven and reproduce it in the earth, so that when He said, let's make man in our image, after our likeness, uh, angels were about to see what God would look like if He were visible in the realm of the earth. And so God began to put His image in the earth, and His glory, His crowning point would be to put His image in the earth. And at at the evening of the sixth day, God has a man in His image with dominion. He puts His image in His sanctuary. Of course, you know Adam lost that dominion, and throughout all the Scriptures, God built different tabernacles as a microcosm of what He wanted to do to ultimately fill the earth again with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Now we can fast forward then to John chapter 1, because John chapter 1 is John the Apostle going back clear back to the Genesis paradigm, and he almost as if he's quoting Genesis, except he replaces it with Christ, because he says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and the light was the light of men. And all of a sudden, you see almost a repeat of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and then God says that there be light. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and Jesus was that light. And then you see on down in John chapter 1 that he uh, begins to come to uh, uh, Nathanael, and he says to Nathanael, why do you marvel? Because uh, I saw you under the fig tree. From henceforth you will see greater things than these. From henceforth you will see the angels of God ascend and descend 
on the Son of Man. Now let me just tell you that Jesus was the image of God. He was the Son of Man. And what many people don't put together is the only place other than that the angels of God ascended and descended was at Bethel when Jacob wrestled with the angel. And he says, this is the gate of heaven and this is the house of God. And this is Bethel. Well, Jesus walks on the scene and says, everything you've seen up to this point was only a shadow, a microcosmic view of what heaven looked like, but I'm the true temple, I'm the true tabernacle of God, and from henceforth you're going to see the angels of God ascend and descend on the Son of Man, because the new man is the gate of heaven. The old man was the gate of hell, and the new man was the gate of heaven. What are you releasing in the earth would be my question. And then Jesus comes on down through that very same chapter and starts talking about destroy this temple. He goes into the temple. He starts to cleanse the temple. He talks about you destroy this temple and three days. I'm going to raise it back up again. And Jesus begins to identify the fact that the real temple of God is not meant to be a building someplace where we could put God in a little box and keep Him you know, designated and isolated over there someplace where He doesn't have any uh, influence in the earth. Jesus was about, even as He moves through the book of John, says to the Samaritan woman, your people see we need to worship God here, and ours say we need to worship God there. And Jesus said the hour is coming, and it now is when real worshipers are going to worship God in spirit and in truth. In other words, the location of worship is not about a location in a building because there's a new temple. There's a new body. There's a new people about to arise. And that was the groan that was upon creation. And Romans 8 was the birthing of this brand new creation as God would bring about his new creation project. Uh, you see Adam as the old creation, the old heaven and the old earth were passing away, and God was bringing on a new heaven and a new earth. And if you'd ask any Jewish boy about heaven and earth, he would say heaven and earth is where God meets with man, and that's in his temple. Except God expanded his temple, and he began to release in the earth uh, his image again. And then you see Jesus, who is brought later in the book of John, into the uh, to the temple to be uh, to be examined by the high priest, and he the scripture takes great pain to point out that the scripture says to and when Jesus walked into the temple, he says, "Behold, the man," and so all of a sudden the image of God was placed back in his temple and God's image is being rebirthed. Now let me tell you something. I think sometimes we've made a lot of mistakes about what we think the image of God looks like. But what we see in the New Testament is Jesus revealing what God looks like. He demonstrates His goodness and His mercy. And I'm going to say this, because I know this is not popular right now, but He also demonstrates God's judgment and God's corrective and I want to say that as well, God's corrective judgments. See, there's no such thing as mercy without judgment. And He announced some judgment upon a religious system and apostate Israel, and especially in the Gospel of Luke where He says, these are the days of vengeance, that all things which were spoken might be fulfilled. And also, as you get into the book of Revelation, He said, this is the wrath of the Lamb. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying that God doesn't have some judgment, but He shows you that His primary goal, and even through, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot of stuff about, uh, I don't want to get, you know, controversial here today, but, uh, you know, throughout people trying to negate some things that God did in the Old Testament. When you, you look at the whole storyline, God gave even the nations that judgment came on like the Canaanites and uh, the land of Canaan. He said that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. And so he let Israel set down in uh, Egypt for 400 years to give the Canaanites and the uh, Amorites time, uh, if you would, to come back uh, to their senses and to repent before God would drive them out of the land. So even when you look at the judgments of God, they are always without fail. His intention is to bring about victory and to bring about His divine purpose of redemption. Now that's old covenant concept and to some degree, but what I'm trying to show you is that the image of God is maybe, you know, we think in terms sometimes we're looking for God, uh, you know, in other words, I think we, we, we have such as a, 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 an Americanized idea what God would look like that sometimes I think we, uh, we are like the Jews of the first century 
where when he showed up, he didn't show up like they thought he would. He came humble, meek, lowly, sitting on a colt and the foal of an ass, and he didn't act like they thought he would act. In other words, sometimes I think our preconceived ideas of what God would look like are different. I do know this. He says, you will know them because they, they're my disciples, because they have one love, one to another. I think there's so many voices today and so many people fighting over details, even among Scripture and among saints, that I think sometimes we need to beat our swords and weapons into plowshares, because what the world needs to see is that we have love one towards another. That's His image being brought forth into the earth, and that's what God's... In, in, even as you see, uh, you know, He talks about even the troubles of this time are for the intent of being conformed to the image of His Son, because God wants to fill the earth with a whole company of sons, as we shared with you in prior segments, that are bearing His image, so that the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, and that God's temple and tabernacle would encompass the whole cosmos and the whole earth. And I believe that's the fullness of what Revelation chapter 21 is talking about, is God filling His... And, and even as you uh, go, get into the latter parts of Revelation 21, said, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And so when we're in Christ and Christ is in us, the whole house is the whole cosmos filled with the glory of God as it bears His image and He brings redemption to His creation. I think those are powerful, glorious concepts. Now let me just go on down. He said, you know, that moreover whom He did predestine, these He also called. Whom He called, these He also justified. And whom He justified, these He also glorified. And we probably talked about in some prior segments that our justification is through the death of Christ and through the sacrifice of Jesus in Hebrews 10, we were, we were sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and then He has perfected forever them that are sanctified. And then we see the latter part of it said, what shall then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That's powerful. See, I brushed over that so fast, but these are points that I think people need to hear. God is for us. He's not against us. For who can, uh, If God is for us, who can be against us? Who did not, he who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? And who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Now let me just stop here for a moment. If God did not spare His Son, if He was willing to give up His Son on our behalf, how can we stop and think God is not willing to give us freely all things? In other words, why would we think God would withhold healing or deliverance or blessing or prosperity or peace or happiness for us, when these are things that He easily gives to us. If He didn't hold back His Son, why would He hold back any other good thing? Who shall bring charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died. Furthermore, is also risen who is even at the right hand of God. He was delivered for our offenses, but He was raised for our justification. And in the fact that He's already been raised and that He was the full uh, package of God dealing with our sin, He's seated at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Then He goes on to ask the question, then who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, 
nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Now these texts are not about my love for Him. These texts are about His love for me. Let me just read this to you then from, uh, from the message, and, and uh, it's so powerful. It says, so what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing Himself to the worst by sending His own Son, is there anything else He wouldn't gladly, freely do for us? Who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's children? God's chosen. Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins spoken or listed in Scripture can separate us from His love. God never stops loving you. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, uh, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. So no matter what you're going through, whether it's good times or bad times, be sure of this, nothing can separate you from God's love for you. That's pretty powerful stuff. He never stops loving you. He's, we, we have to think about God as being a good, good Father, because even when He brings correction, it is not because He hates us, it's because He loves us with an everlasting love, and He can't stop loving us. You need to know that today. Now let me just take a moment, because we've just run out of time, but we really do need you to partner with us to help us to continue to take the gospel of grace and the gospel of the kingdom around the world. If you've not become a partner or you'd like to give a one-time gift, the easiest way to do it is to go to my website, there's a link on the screen, or you can scan the QR code there. It'll take you directly to a link where you can sow into the ministry through uh, your PayPal account, or, or you can give via a credit or MasterCard, Visa, or your, uh, you know, your debit card. Any of them can go through the PayPal portal. You can also call the number on the screen, and someone will take your call, or you can send a check and money order to the number on the screen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When He uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.